first who sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of the Torah. Barukata Yehoa Elohinu Malach Halalem Asher Kishanu Bamitzvatai Vetsibanu Lo Asak Mentevrei Torah. Please, Yehovah, make the Torah's words sweet in my mouth, in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name in the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with your commandments and commanded us to count the Omer. Barukata Yehoa Elohinu Malak Hadalem Asher Kishanu Ba Mitzvatai Vetsibanu A Safarat Ha Omar. Today is 40 days, which is five weeks and five days of the Omer. Amen. <coughs> you may come to the tables if you desire. If there's not enough room, we will make room for you. As we are opening up the Word of God again to 1 Peter chapter 4, we are slowly zooming in on the last chapter. We are 26 weeks in, so we are middle half a year going on here, trying to get through First Peter. <coughs> we have uh, a couple more verses, so a couple more weeks in uh, First Peter 4, and then we'll be moving. Oh, that's in Ephesians. Let me look real quick. Hallelujah. We have, what, another, probably another week in. And in 1 Peter 4, and then we'll be going into 1 Peter 5, and maybe a couple weeks there. Maybe I'll be finished by the time I go to Israel. Then when I come back, we'll get right into 1 uh, Peter <coughs> uh, and see what uh, the Word of God has for us. If uh, Again, if I'm going to subtitle it, it would be <coughs> Sharing the Suffering of the Messiah. And we've known we've been through a lot of subjects that we have found in 1 Peter. 1 Peter is a book full of a lot of information, really dealing with us as born-again believers. When we have arrived now at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, it says, Loved ones, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. Instead, rejoice insofar as you share in the sufferings of Messiah, so that at the revelation of his glory you may also Rejoice and be glad. If you are insulted for the name of the Messiah, you are fortunate for the spirit of glory and of God rest on you. For let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or evildoer or as a troublemaker. But if anyone suffers for following Messiah, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in his name. Now, very quickly, let me just make this connection to the <coughs> previous context. And you know that we always try to do that because it is one upon another. We're building something in First Peter, correct? And so we have this Peter emphasizing in verses 7 through 11 that the prophetic words spoken by Yeshua regarding the persecution of his followers was already taking place, but that it might well escalate <coughs> in the near future. So we know that where they were in Turkey, there was going to be some persecution because they're out of their element. We also know that there was some persecution happening with the apostles. But we also know that <coughs> the destruction of the temple had not yet occurred. And we know that when that destruction occurs, there's a great amount of persecution that starts to happen. So even though they're being persecuted, it has not reached an escalation yet, and it will. So he's just warning them to be prepared just in case. Remember, we're not here to look for suffering, but if it comes... Then it comes, correct? We also see that by being ready to face persecution for your faith, <coughs> it requires a couple things. We talked about it. Sound judgment, right? A sober spirit for the purpose of prayer, correct? And really, if you just wrap that up, it just means you can't lose your mind. You can't just... So anyway, 
uh, a sound judgment, sober spirit, and a purpose of prayer. We also understood that sound judgment means that you are aligning yourself, everything in your life, with what the scriptures say and teach, right? The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. So we know that this sober spirit <coughs> is that you're not overcome with the spirit of despair, but remaining steadfast in a life of faith. And also, because you're going to be experiencing persecution, you have to have a clear mind, right? So you cannot allow anything to disrupt that thinking process or judgment place of, <coughs> of your frontal lobe. You can't allow, allow even the uh, alcohol or drugs or anything that you are engaged in <coughs> stop you from being able to hear the Ruach, especially in the time of crisis. And then prayer means that we're always seeking the lead of the Ruach and all the more as the times become more difficult because as easy as you have it, you might not have it as easy later on. So Peter also emphasized that we have a need to consider the needs of others in the community because we link that with the community because what happens sometimes when we're in persecution, we scatter. And actually the opposite is required, <coughs> according to First Peter, that when persecution comes, we should gather and, uh, and be able to, you know, encourage one another and stand with one another and be hospitable to one another and give to one another and sacrifice for one another. It's not a time if you see that it's time is close that you go and do your own thing. It's about really, and we talked about in Hebrews, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves as it will be, <coughs> especially in these last days. Because in the last days, the reason why you would not assemble is because it's all about you. And we see that in our culture and society today. That the community is being broken and the family is being broken. And we see that in husbands and we see it in wives. We see children. It's about me. It's about me. What are you going to bring me? What are you going to do for me? <coughs> what do you and we see that. And it's completely, totally different than years prior where everything focused around the community helping. And so we also see that we have to utilize the God-given gifts that he's given to each and every one of us. And he gave those gifts not for you but for what? For the body. OK, so <coughs> you're not a gift all by yourself out there running around. It's for the body. And then we talked about the designated leaders and what those leaders are supposed to do. And they are to be careful to give advice according to that scripture. The Bible says not what I think, not what I uh, believe, but what the word of God believes, which means we have to seek to align our words with the Bible, especially in today's society, because <coughs> the world is going a little bit wacky doodle. And we also have to serve in the strength that Yehovah gives us and that we have to have a goal to glorify Yehovah rather than seeking our own advancements, which means sometimes that requires of us to give up some things that we would want <coughs> to complete the goal of Yehovah, not our own advancements, right? So let's jump now into 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. It's actually going to be a short night of teaching, so I appreciate you not saying amen. But in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Loved ones, so who's he talking about? <coughs> Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal taking place among you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Now, <coughs> we can ask the question, and you might think, I don't know why we'd have to ask this question, but we're asking the question, who is he talking to? There are some commentators that say that First Peter is talking to Jewish people. Some say he's only talking to Gentile people. And so the answer would be yes. But we also have a moment here in verse 12 that kind of alludes to the fact that he really might be, especially right now, zoning into Gentile people. And the reason is, is because of what this verse says. Can anyone just, if you glance to that verse... <coughs> Give me a reason why I would say that this verse kind of centers more toward a Gentile than a Jewish person. Something strange. What does that mean? They're not used to persecution. Exactly. So <coughs> what are Jewish people used to? Persecution. They always say if you tell someone you're Jewish, there's going to be persecution. So when it says, uh, loved ones, do not be surprised at the fire of your ordeal. If you're Jewish, you're not surprised. It is what it is. It comes with the territory, right? And so it looks like he's talking <coughs> and focusing on those Gentile believers who were not persecuted. Because you do realize that in the times of the Roman Empire, that really the Roman Empire didn't care what God you served. 
You could have served 20 gods. They didn't care. The only thing they needed you to understand was Caesar was the number one. <coughs> you could serve the god of a stone. You could serve a god of a tree. It didn't matter. Your neighbors could serve different gods than you. You could went to your neighbor and said, listen, I found a god of frogs. And he would have said, oh, that's wonderful. No one cared. What, when they start caring is when you start then to serve Yehovah. And what is the creed or the mantra of serving him? Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God, and there are no other gods. So now <coughs> they lived quite comfortably having any God they wanted to serve. But now when they make a decision to serve Yehovah, <coughs> persecution comes because you don't tell Caesar there's someone higher than him. And you don't tell Caesar that he's not a God. So they're now going to experience some persecution that they have never experienced before because they live in a society where they could serve <coughs> and worship any god, and there was not going to be anything wrong, and they were not going to be um, persecuted. But now, because they're going to make this statement, there's going to be some persecution. The Jewish people knew it all along, right? So what we need to do is look at that verse, and we need to take it to heart. We need to look at that exhortation, <coughs> and we need to receive it into our spirit, because we sit here in the United States, and we have enjoyed centuries of acceptance with no real persecution for our faith. Correct? Yes, people have said some things about you. Some people come against you. But not real persecution. Not what we see in other nations and other countries that other believers have to go through. Losing their family, being put in prison for <coughs> hundreds of years or tens and tens of years or having their head chopped off. We don't have that. It's not the same in other parts of the world. So we have enjoyed centuries. So when we look at 1 Peter chapter 4.12, he could be speaking to us, couldn't he? Don't think it's such a strange thing that now you start to experience some test in your life that you have not yet experienced. <coughs> and don't think, especially with <coughs> the prosperity gospel, the prosperity gospel is wrong in, in a couple ways. And one way that it's wrong is that you are to be blessed and blessed and only blessed. So if you're blessed and blessed and only blessed, then none of these things come, you know, that you are supposed to experience. But then you kind of look at the other other uh, believers and, and if you make that conclusion, then there's something wrong with them. And we know that suffering can come to anyone. Right. So whether you believe in that God can bless you and I believe that he can bless you and that he will <coughs> supply your needs, I believe that. But it doesn't mean that it then isolates me from a suffering or a test that will go in on my life. Right. Because if persecution comes, they're not looking for who is prosperous. OK, you're prosperous. I'm not <coughs> not causing persecution. I'm looking for poor people to, to persecute. And he's not that's not happening that way. Right. There is a quote. Now, I, I'm going to bring this quote up here and it's found in the book called The Privilege of Persecution and Other Things the Global Church Knows That We Don't. It's from Moody uh, Pub, uh, Publishing. And so I gave you <coughs> you can look that up if you want to read the book. Let me give you this quote. It says, in the West, we are not persecuted. We are intimidated. It says, in other words, we may have discovered a bridge to the unbelieving world, but most of the traffic is moving in one direction. Which means we have created a bridge to this world, but instead of <coughs> coming against that world and showing them a different lifestyle, we are flowing with them. So now we look like them and now we act like them. Now we do things like them. And you really can't tell the difference of whether they're worldly or not worldly. So it's moving in just one direction. On the other hand, the persecuted church experiences a hostile culture every day and doesn't worry about pleasing it. <coughs> they don't give in to that pressure to adapt. They believe that they have been saved from that culture. So why should they want to go back? back to that culture. That's that church. <coughs> we in the West want to bridge to the unbelievers and we want to be like them so that we bring them in. And that bridge is going in one direction. There's not a change. So a lot of times in contemporary Christianity, what you're going to find is that there's not going to be persecution. Because you're going to be like the world. You who are deciding to be like him. <coughs> will be the ones that will be persecuted. So he says, don't think it's a strange thing when you experience this fiery ordeal. So let's look at that word fire, because fire means something. Fire was a common metaphor 
for suffering and persecution in the ancient world. And in fact, we saw that in first Peter chapter one, verse seven, as the scripture says, <clears throat> these trials are so that the true metal of your faith, far more valuable than gold, which perishes, though refined by fire, may come to light and praise and glory and honor at the revelation of the Messiah, Yeshua. So in understanding that, then we have to understand this, <clears throat> that each and every one of us will have tests to go through because tests bring out the gold and the silver and get rid of the stuff that's not supposed to be there. You will never outgrow going through a test. Tests are given to you <clears throat> to see how much value you have. So the question would be, do you know what happens when times of suffering and persecution comes? And the answer would be, if I was asking you <clears throat> before you get to the next slide, if persecution comes to you, what is your what is your different thought pattern? Is there a different thought pattern or you just say persecution is coming? Is there something that happens within you that's different than when everything is going well? Huh? You pray more. What else do you do? You praise more. <coughs> you get desperate. OK, anything else? Well, here's what you do. You start doing away with what is unnecessary. And you start prioritizing what is necessary. Which means in persecution, you decide, you know, this, I don't need this, and I don't need this, and I don't need this, and what I need is him. <coughs> you start getting rid of those things you don't need and start getting those things which you do need. Going through a persecution, you no longer care about a McDonald's. You no longer care about a Dairy Queen. You no longer care about going here or going there or shopping or doing this. What do you care about? I need to get to my on the, on the, on the ground, my face to God, and I need to get through this thing. So you start prioritizing your life differently than when everything is flowing. Unfortunate, when we just have it easy, we let the things that are supposed to be primary secondary. <clears throat> so a lot of times when I look at people within the church, even this Kahila, and they make decisions opposite of that word of God, it's because their life is easy. So it's going to take a change and a shift of easiness <clears throat> and some pressure is going to have to come. What's going to happen? They're going to come and they're going to say, pray, I'm going through something. And in reality, the whole reason why they're going through is because they have some priorities that are out of whack and God's trying to get them back in. And I'm not praying for you to be <coughs> to be lifted up out of that thing. I want you to walk through that and feel it because you need to change that which was primary, which you made secondary and bring it back to primary because he is the one. He is the only one. He's the one we serve. He's the one we uh, look after. He's the one that we follow. And we need to be obedient to him and follow these commandments and quit Given up those things of that word for our own pleasures and our own thinking processes and our own beliefs. <clears throat> and we only do that because it's easy. Right? And I said it, the, the churches over there, they still want to meet together because they don't have it easy. Right? So they know there's a source that they have to have. And that source is when they come together and they're able to worship the Lord and hear that truth. That is what keeps them together. We only have <coughs> so much room in the drawer. How many have what we call a junk drawer? <coughs> How many have more than one? But let's just focus on the one. Okay? Because some of your drawers are all junk drawers. But you have this one drawer. Listen, I growing up, my mother had one. <coughs> we have some right there in front of the door. And here's the thing. <coughs> you keep stuffing and stuffing and stuffing, Correct? And then you get something else and you stuff that thing. And when you shut it and then you try to open it again, it's something back there. And then you're just like, oh, I'm so frustrated. And it, it takes you for a moment after a couple of frustrations to say, I need to what? Oh, let me tell you, I'm going to spend this Saturday cleaning out this drawer. Right. And so you take it all out. And when you take it all out, what are you deciding? What to pitch or what to move to another drawer, but what to pitch? <coughs> what is not necessary and what is necessary? Correct? Because that drawer is important to you, but you know that you've overloaded it. So when you run out of room, you start getting rid of the things that you can do without. And sometimes we have placed so much in our lives that we run out of room for him. And it's time we open the drawer and say, do I really need that? No. <coughs> Does this need really to be a priority in my life? No. 
because I need to be able to open that drawer and have all of him in there instead of everything else that's in there. Because you can't find him sometimes when you have all that in there, can you? So he tells us that there's going to be a fire. And count yourself fortunate. We don't find ourselves fortunate in the text. Huh? But he says, <coughs> you're going to do this because there's going to be some testing in your life. Hit that next slide. Loved ones, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal taking place among you to what? To test you. Why is it there? To test you as though something strange were happening to you. So for your testing, and for your testing means as a means <coughs> of proving the reality of one's faith or even strengthening one's faith. Because sometimes we think we got it all wrapped up and we know everything and everything's good for us and it only takes a test to realize exactly where we are at. I'll tell you what, I, I do my, I'll tell you what, I love the Lord and I love people. I get along with everyone. Be careful. Because then something will happen <coughs> to prove whether that is the case or not the case. Oh, you know, don't worry, I don't pick up any offense. Something will happen to see how quickly you have picked up that offense. Because when you say that, then there's a proving of that reality of your faith. And it comes through testing because God wants you to be able to say it and be true about it and not say it and not be true about it. We do realize, however, that there's a difference between testing and being tempted. OK, so here's let me let me just make this uh, <coughs> difference and the slide will come up here. Testing is to prove value. It reveals the value that's within you. Being tempted <coughs> is when something is trying to get you to do something you should not do. Yehoah tests us. The devil tempts us. That's the difference. I'll give you the example. In the garden, what was in there? What was the two things that were in there that was very specific to God? Tree of life <coughs> and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why did he put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil there? For a test. A test to reveal <coughs> the quality of their faith. Because if he says, don't eat from this, then their faith is challenged. There's a test. They have to do it. There could not be a test if there's no tree. Right? So the test is there. But who comes along and changes that test into a temptation? Satan. <coughs> and he comes as a snake and then he starts pointing to things and showing that he wants them to eat see the tree is there not because God wants them to eat God wants <coughs> their fiery ordeal to bring and refine them so that they can go and say it's there and I'm not eating it because I believe in the tree of life I believe what he said and therefore they would pass the test but the enemy turns that around and tries to tempt them with it because he's not concerned <coughs> about the he just wants them to be disobedient so Yehovah tests us, the devil tempts us. We can find this in James chapter 1, uh, verse 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brother. That's really hard for us right there. When you encounter various what? Trials. Why do you count them joyful? Because what are they for? To reveal your value. So that's, that's important, right? Right? You all find a lump of something, you take it to someone who <coughs> is able to clean it up and put it in the fire. You're excited. You, you want that in the fire so that if there's gold in there, it comes out. Right? So you want it tested. All right? <coughs> Knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance. And let endurance have its perfect work so that you may be perfect and complete doing what? Lacking in nothing. That's the purpose of a test. That's why you count it all joy. I'm going through a test. Hallelujah. I'm going to pass my test. Glory to God. <coughs> Can't wait for the next one. Hallelujah. As he continues, we arrive at verse 13 and 16. He says, let no one say when he is tempted that I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself tempts no one. But each one is 
tempted when he is dragged away and enticed by his own desire. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. So as the enemy comes <coughs> and lands on that tree, which is the test, he can only tempt Eve because Eve has already been looking at it. Eve has already been enticed by it. Right? It looked good. It looked good to eat. If she would have not have been allowing her flesh to be drawn, that tree would have remained the test, not a temptation. So Jehovah did not put it in there. <coughs> to tempt them. He put it in there to test them. All right. We should be careful not to fall into this misguided notion then that these who suffer the most are therefore most righteous. If you're going through a lot of stuff right now, just don't think, oh, I am so righteous and you are not. Because the main point is that we should not look for persecution, like I said in the beginning, but we should not be surprised if it comes our way <coughs> when the world around us hates the Messiah and we have confessed him to be Lord and Savior. They're not going to like you. He said they don't like you because they don't like me. It's not because of you. Don't take it personal. They just don't like you. They don't like me. <coughs> so what does he say? Loved ones. Don't think it's strange when you go through these testings. It's not, it's not something you should be kind of shocked at. Right? The next scripture. Instead... Do what? Rejoice. When's the last time you rejoiced? Remember when you used to go take a test or you go to school and they say it's time for a test? How many stood up and said, hallelujah, I'm so excited. <laughs> in fact, if you did that, everyone else in the class will look at you like, okay, we're going to get you after class. Because there's no sense that you have to be so excited about a test. Because none of us like to test. We didn't like a quiz. We didn't like a pop quiz. We didn't like a test. Right? We all made that same sound. We're going to have a test tomorrow. What was the sound? <sighs> right? This is why God doesn't tell you when a test is coming, because he don't want to hear you going, Ugh. <laughs> So it's a surprise test. It's a pop-up test. Instead, rejoice insofar as you share in the sufferings of the Messiah, so that at the revelation of his glory, you may also, what? Rejoice and be glad. So let's look at that <coughs> to share the suffering of the Messiah. There are two ways that we do that. The first way is that we suffer because of one's faith in the Messiah, <coughs> and we also suffer because of one's association with the Messiah. So just being associated with the Messiah or having this faith in him is going to cause you to have suffering, especially in today's society. Correct? The other way is that we suffer in a similar way as he suffered because we are deciding to live righteously as he did. There is a turn that's happening where, and this is within the body. I'm not even talking about the world. <coughs> within the body, they're not believing the word anymore. Within the body, they think it's outdated anymore. Within the body, they don't think that we should run our lives according to this ancient book anymore. And you're going to suffer, especially within <coughs> the church realm, because you are still going to live righteously as he did, even though they're telling you that how he lived was for that time and that day. And we've all heard it. You can eat pig now. That was for them. They didn't have refrigeration, but they had God. God certainly could have covered <coughs> the pig, right? I mean, he, he parted to see. I mean, <coughs> you don't think he can keep a pig from rotten if it's okay to eat? But it wasn't that he couldn't keep it clean. He just said to eat it is unclean. Just be obedient to me. <coughs> so when you're doing the opposite, you're going to be suffering because you want to live righteously. And then he says, because of that, you need to keep on rejoicing. Keep on rejoicing means that you're going to set your eyes upon the goal as worthy of the present suffering. I'm looking beyond what I'm going through. So many times we just look at what we're going through and we feel what we're going through. And I'm not saying you don't have any emotions about what you're going through, but you also have to be able to see, even though you're in the midst of it, you have to see beyond it. You have to be able to see that tomorrow's another day, even though you're focused on today. You have to know that he's going to watch over you and that he will never leave you nor forsaken you, which means that <coughs> this storm or this test will also pass. Right. Because you set your eyes on the goal. So the question is, what are our eyes set on? What is the goal that we have just to survive today or to please him today? This speaks then of this kind of inner peace that comes from knowing that all who are in Messiah will ultimately be victorious in him. You know, even 
if my life brings me to a place of death, I'm still victorious because to be <coughs> to be absent from my body is to be present with the Lord. And when Yeshua dies on the cross, it, the, the joy that's set before him is you. We've said that before. You are his joy. But he doesn't get on a cross thinking that God can't raise him from the dead. He's on a cross knowing that God will raise him from the dead. Why? Because God said it. Therefore, his vindication will be coming out of the grave. Your vindication at the end of the day, <clears throat> we want vindication now. We want our enemies to see exactly what happened now. But the vindication will be when you stand before Yehovah, you're standing before Yehovah. Has nothing to do with the physical. Because to everyone's eye, it looked like Yeshua died. And lost everything, right? To the religious community, they were like, see, he wasn't the Messiah. And to everyone else, see what happened. And some of the disciples even ran away thinking, well, well this is it. <coughs> but Yeshua knew it wasn't it. He was going to be vindicated. We're also going to be vindicated. So it's okay. It's our pride that wants vindication now. I want, to, oh, I want people to see me being vindicated. But most of our vindication is seeing someone else. <laughs> right? But that's not how we live. Or that's not how we're supposed to live. So if we go back to that scripture then, what does it say? Instead, rejoice in so much as you share in the suffering of the Messiah, so that. So that word, so that, in Greek is hine. And hine actually means in Greek, with the goal that. So you are to then rejoice in that you're sharing the suffering of the Messiah with the goal that there's a revelation of his glory. That's the goal. I have a revelation of his glory and that I will rejoice and be glad in that revelation. That's the reason why I can rejoice because I have a goal. And that goal is set before me. I'm keeping my eyes fixed upon Yeshua and the goal of being with him in the victory of the resurrection enables us to bear up under suffering and persecution in this world. Let me tell you. If I die today, then what's it matter? I'm no longer in this world. Where am I at? I'm with him. I, I don't care what happens after I'm dead. You're not up there, you know, wringing your hand. Oh, I don't know what's going on. You're, you're in the presence of the Lord. You know what I'm saying? <coughs> now, I know you love everyone, but I don't think you're up there thinking, oh, <laughs> you're up there dancing and shouting and meeting people. And you know what I'm saying? Because time and every the world will take care of itself, correct? You're in a different place, a different dimension. You're not up there sulking somewhere in a corner crying underneath a tree. Oh, coming back and visiting people. Ooh. You don't need someone to get you from the darkness to the light because you're stuck somewhere. I'm stuck because I just can't leave. Go to the light. Go to the light. You either went to the light. Listen, <coughs> when you died, if you didn't go to the light, you, you were in a bad place. And there's no escape from where you just went to. Okay? So you can look for the light all you want. You ain't going nowhere. If you didn't see the light right away, <laughs> you were in serious trouble. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says, and this gives us hope. Therefore, since we have such a what? You know what that gives to me? That gets me to understand that there have been those who have gone before me, who have been resurrected. They understand the glory. They now see him. They are rejoicing. And we can also rejoice because there's a cloud of witnesses that went before us. <coughs> Surrounding us, let us also get rid, because they are, let us also get rid of every weight and entangling sin. Because where do we want to be? We want to join them as a witness. Right? So let us run with endurance the race set before us, focusing on who? Our jobs, our money, our time. No, on Yeshua, the initiator and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and he has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. He didn't care about what it looked like. See, to die on a cross in those days <coughs> was shameful. And he didn't care. To live the way you're living and to be persecuted, to be talked about, to be to be to suffer for his sake, it should not bother you. Does it? Yes, <coughs> because we're human. We have flesh. 
and we have feelings. But here's the thing. <coughs> we have to learn that vindication overcomes our feelings. One day I will see him face to face, so it doesn't matter. Take your best shot. Say what you want to say. Do what you want to do. It really doesn't matter to me because I have my eyes fixed. And I'm joining the witnesses, so therefore I'm rejoicing and being glad of the revelation of the glory that God has given to me. Instead of focusing on what I'm going to at this moment. Because I will pass this test. First Peter chapter 4, 14 says, so then if you are insulted for the name of the Messiah, read that. You are what? <coughs> you are fortunate. So when you come and say, listen, someone's talking about it, we say, oh, you are fortunate. That's really not the response that I wanted. I wanted you to say, oh, I'm so sorry. Let us pray. Let us ask God to do something with them. Instead, they're like, you are fortunate. Give me a high five. What? Glory. We don't respond that way, right? If you're insulted for the name of the Messiah. Now, again, you're insulted for who? Which means because of the way you're living. <coughs> if you're insulted because your bad behavior, your bad character, your mouth. Well, I don't know what to tell you then. That's a whole different story. We have to keep it in perspective. You know what I'm saying? Someone insulted me. Okay. If you're insulted for the name of the Messiah, you are fortunate for the spirit of glory and of God does what? It rests on you, which means you are able to overcome this. You're fortunate. Hallelujah. <coughs> if you've been reviled for the name of the Messiah, means that you are being reviled for being known as a follower of him, as seeking to live as he lived. That's okay. <coughs> you are following him. You are living the way he lives, and therefore you are being insulted. You are being revived for the name. Reviled, not revived, reviled. Remember that from a Hebrew perspective, the name by which one is known embodies a person's core values and character. So here's where we got to make this connection. If you say that you are, keep, go back. <coughs> go back, go back, go back. Where are you going? Okay, I don't know where you were going, free. If you say that you are a follower of him, I come to you in the name of Yeshua, you need to understand what that means. That means you embody <coughs> his core value and his character. So don't say you come. Don't say that you are a follower. Don't say that you are a disciple. Don't say that you even love him if your core value and your character does not match him. Someone cannot come and say, I'm coming, uh, <coughs> Pastor Jeff sent me to say to you, they cannot be that example and come in my name unless they come in the way that I would come. So if they came and said, Pastor Jeff said, you're an idiot, you would know I wouldn't, that's not how I would say, right? So they're not embodying my what? My core value or my character. So they are misrepresenting me. Correct? Be careful that you do not misrepresent Yeshua in your life. Because to carry his name <coughs> is to embody his core value and his character. Which is why we really need to look into our lives. These words echo Isaiah chapter 11 verse uh, 2 that says, The Ruach of Adonai will rest upon him. Talking about Yeshua, right? So we know the Spirit of God rests on him. The Spirit of what? Wisdom and insight. So, so what did Yeshua have? Wisdom and insight. <coughs> the spirit of counsel and might. What did he have? Counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge. What did he have? Knowledge. The fear of Yehovah. What did he have? The fear of Yehovah. Well, if that's what was on him, then what needs to be on us? If we're going to re represent him. You can represent you. Right? Just don't say, I'm coming in. This is what Yeshua said. No. You might say, this is what I'm thinking, and we get that because <coughs> we heard your thinking before. We understand exactly how you're coming, <laughs> but you're representing Yeshua. So then how does Peter apply it to believers in Yeshua? Because remember, who's he talking to? He's talking to those that are exiled, dispersed in Turkey, but he's also talking to who else? To us within this community. Peter applies it to the believers in Yeshua because the Ruach HaKadosh who empowered Yeshua 
in the time of his suffering, likewise will empower all who are his if they are persecuted for their faith. <coughs> Another way it said, if the same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, then he'll quicken you. So if the same spirit that dwelt in Yeshua gave him knowledge, then the same spirit will give you knowledge. If it's might and counsel, it will be might and counsel. So why do we have such a disconnect? Why are we disconnected like that? The work of the Ruach, empowering the child of Yehoah to persevere under suffering, that is proof of one's genuine faith and guaranteed salvation in Yeshua. If when you are tested, <coughs> you are quitting, then you are not exhibiting the core value and character of Yeshua. First Peter 4, 15 and 16. For let none of you suffer as a what? A murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or even as a troublemaker. Now that sounds like it's kind of like outside the realm, but this is maybe what they were before. But how many know that when persecution comes, <coughs> it can change a lot of us? Let's just say persecution comes and there's a lack of food. You might become a thief. Right? <coughs> you might become a murderer. You might become an evildoer. So let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a troublemaker. But if anyone suffers for following Messiah, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. What this scripture is talking about as we continue to read through <coughs> what we've started with and now we're ending up in verse 16. What he's saying is even in times of persecution, we must maintain a righteous life. No matter what. You maintain a righteous life. It kind of goes back to the community, which means, well, I only have... Uh, a little bit of bread left <laughs> and my family comes first I'm sorry to say <coughs> well man we talked about it what did Elijah say to the widow woman what do you got I got enough for me and my son then we're gonna die okay so before you do that can you make me some pancakes oh <laughs> we would say that's selfish right but here's the thing, <coughs> you maintain a righteous life no matter what you're going through. So if she, as a widow, would have helped <coughs> someone before, even if she has hardly nothing, she will still what? Maintain that same righteous life. Even in persecution, because persecution can change a lot of us thinking differently, acting differently. <coughs> Correct? So if evil is... Uh, uh, you know, brought against us, perpetuated against us, we must act in righteousness and uphold our resolve to walk in the footsteps of Yeshua. You and the persecution that I'm experiencing and the suffering that I'm going through should never change who I am, the core value and the character of who I say I serve, and that is Yeshua, because no matter what I'm going through, I still must exhibit Yeshua, even if I don't feel like I want to, I have to submit my flesh <coughs> to the Ruach HaKadosh in my life. Which can be exhausting. Because our flesh still wants to rise. And speak our mind. And give you a piece of it. And we just say, and even if it's wrong, I just need to get it off my chest. No, you keep it on your chest. <coughs> and then give it to the Ruach. We don't need to hear it. Keep it. We are, we're, not, we're not inviting you to give it to us. <laughs> How about that? Now, I just want to tell you something. I don't need to share it. You don't need to share nothing with me. Just go to the Lord and share it with him. And then if he wants me to hear it, he'll tell me. You can say, do you believe the Lord talks to you? I do. Then if you believe the Lord talks to you, you believe the Lord talks to me? I do. Well, then go tell him what you want to tell me, and he'll tell me. Because when he tells me, he's going to tell me through his core value and his character. <coughs> and right now, it doesn't look like you have any core value or character of Yeshua. It is all you coming right now. So we can't let the rules, and where are your rules at? Right? 
right? And this is a rule book. Now, I'm not going to pretend I played football or any of those, <coughs> you know, um, games, athletic things, you know, that people have. But I do know that there are different things and different plays that, uh, you know, playbook that they, they the, the players all have to know so that if they yell on a number out, everyone knows what play to do, right? You're not just guessing at what's going on. <coughs> they guard that playbook very, very carefully so that the other teams don't know what those plays are because it, what good is knowing a play when everyone else knows the play and they might change it up sometimes, the numbers or whatever, and however they call it, I don't know. Here's the thing. These are our rule books. And the only way to be able to play the right way and to know what the enemy is doing and how to do it and how to overcome and how to win is to know the rule book and to play by the rule book, right? <coughs> so if you're saying we're going to run this and, <coughs> and, the, and, and the one guy is supposed to run to the left, but some he just decides I'm going to run to the right, the play don't work, right? And a lot of times in our own lives, this rule book is not working because we have not read it, memorized it, let alone live by it. Well, if you yell at me, I'm going to yell at you. That's not what the Bible says. What's the Bible say? When someone comes after you with a harsh way, you are to what? Return it with a soft answer. How many know we still struggle in the soft answer? <coughs> right? We still struggle. We, we struggle with not even being able to be quiet. We don't even understand bridle or tongue. We think that it means to ride it and ride it and <coughs> go faster and speak more. <laughs> we don't know. We didn't know it meant to shut up. Right? <coughs> so it really it depends on how we act. Right? So we can't let the rules be thrown to the side just because we are being persecuted. We have a character to uphold. And <coughs> the character that we are to uphold is that we are to be, and we're going to look at the verse, we are to be Christians. Now, you don't hear us use that word Christian very often for the simple reason we try to make a, <coughs> a, a slight difference, even though if someone said, you know, like uh, Sister Annie, who that little short, little Scottish woman, when she came up and she said, you know, what is this? And I said, well, you know, it's Zipti, I'm <coughs> Messianic. Then I said, I'm a Christian like you. Because, you know, you, you have to go a little step further because they don't under always understand messianic. But we shy away from calling ourselves Christian, and I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. But <coughs> Christian is actually found two other times in the apostolic scriptures. OK, so a lot of times in Hebrew roots, you know, if you said I'm a Christian, they would faint because you've used that word Christian because it has such a negative connotation to it. But in Acts chapter 11, 26. No, go back. Let me read that real quick. Ashley. I'm sorry. I didn't know I had it. <coughs> it says, but let none of you suffer as a what? Murderer or a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer, let him not be ashamed, but let him, <coughs> yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So that Greek word for Christian, of course, is that word. And it's found in Acts chapter 11, 26, and also Acts 26, 28, that says, And when he had found him, he brought him into Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church, taught much people, and the disciples were called what? Christians, first in Antioch. Acts chapter 26, 28, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a <coughs> Christian. Well, in the complete Jewish Bible, it will say, Follow the Messiah, and other places it will change all that and make a shift. And that changing is OK, because that really is what it means to be a Christian <coughs> in all three contexts. The meaning is a follower of the Messiah. So in the complete Jewish Bible, when it says follower of the Messiah instead of Christian, it's on the money. OK, <coughs> it also means sharing in his anointed office. So a Christian if you want to use that Greek word instead of using a Hebrew word or the meaning of the Hebrew word, follow the Messiah, means that you are sharing in his anointed office. We have a hard time using it today because it doesn't mean that anymore. <coughs> if you ask, where do you live? We live in America. They would say, oh, you live in a Christian nation. We know that we're not a Christian nation. We do know that there are Christians within the nation, but we know that our nation is not Christian. 
Because if it was, that means that our nation would be a follower of the Messiah. We wouldn't have abortion. We wouldn't have a lot of things that would come down our way. So we, we <coughs> do those things. So therefore, our nation is not Christian in the way that this Bible defines it. But it is in the way that it had started to be defined in the second century, because in the second century, instead of being called a Christian, <coughs> it then developed into Christianity, which is a whole different animal. You understand? The term Christianity is not found into the second century in the writings of the church fathers. So in the first century, a Christian could be someone in the synagogue who is following the Messiah. Not a group of people with a different belief system. It's now become a group of people with a different belief system than the Messiah. Okay? <coughs> so there was, in that first century, no distinction between <coughs> Messianic Judaism and Christianity. There was no distinction. Because when the Gentiles came to know Yeshua, where did they go? To the synagogue. And the scripture says even in Acts, they will learn. Here's the, here's the rules of the Gentile because they will go to the synagogue and learn from Moses what really needs to happen in their lives. So we're going to start with a couple things. Doesn't mean they're only required to these couple things. It just means when someone's coming from the world, they can't know everything that's going on. <coughs> so we want them to know a couple things to get them going. And then as they come to church, didn't you all grow? Aren't you still growing because you come to the house of God? Right? You didn't get born again and know everything and then come here knowing everything. You got born again. <coughs> you started with some very simple instructions, right? What did someone said, read your Bible and come to church. That was the only two things required of you. And then when you come, what, what do you do? You start learning. And then you start looking at your life and saying, well, I can't do that. Oh, I need to get rid of that. Oh, I need to get rid of this. And so there was no distinction between those two. So <coughs> when we look at even at Paul, Paul was a part of what they considered the way. OK, the people of the way, which was a not a different group, but a sect <coughs> in Judaism. The best way I can explain this is to I tell you that I was brought up Church of the Brethren, correct? But when I was 13, I was filled with the Holy Spirit, which means I joined the ranks of Pentecostal people. Right. Spoke in tongues. I believe in healing, <coughs> laying of hands, all that. Where did I still go to church at at 12? Church of the Brethren. Did they believe in speaking in tongues in that church? No, how you all know? No, they didn't. Do they, they believe in all those gifts of the Spirit? No. So there were some of us who were filled with the Holy Spirit <coughs> within the Church of the Brethren. Did we leave the Church of the Brethren because we were filled with the Holy Spirit? No. So in reality, we were a sect within the Church of the Brethren that were Pentecostal. You understand? So there's a sect <coughs> that remained in the synagogue called the Way who were believers of the Messiah, Yeshua, and they were both Jew and Gentile, and they were called Christians because they shared in the anointing of Yeshua. All right? So <coughs> let's look at that, some of those scriptures. Acts 9, 2. And desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. So here's Paul. Where's he going to look for the people of the way? In the synagogue, because where were they? In the synagogue, worshiping the way they always worshiped, except they believed <coughs> in the Messiah. All right? So there was not a different religion. They didn't break off. In Acts 22, 4, And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. <coughs> Acts 24, 5, for we have found this man a pestilent fellow, a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of what? The sect of the Nazarenes. Those in that synagogue that were of the way that were called Christians in Greek. Acts 28, 22. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect... <coughs> we know that everywhere it is spoken against. So here we are, somewhat still in, might be considered Christianity, but a sect within it that follows the Messiah. 
But the reason why we don't affiliate ourselves a lot of times is because of what it now means and is defined. Because everyone is a Christian now within this realm of Christianity. And we know that to be a true Christian means you share in his anointing. You are a follower of him. Not that you go to church, not that you go to this whatever, not that you've been baptized, not that you do whatever. It's that you are a follower of him. And that only manifests itself in your life, <coughs> in your core value, and in your character, right? So the sect is a group that is identified by their beliefs. Then the last part of that verse says, and I'll finish up, <coughs> it says uh, 1 Peter 4.16, Yet if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So to glorify Yehovah in this name, to glorify him in the name of the Messiah as that which the disciple of Yeshua bears. You bear <coughs> the name of the Messiah, which means you bear his value and his character. What he believes, you believe. What he has said, you say. How he lived, you live, in spite of what this world culture is doing, <coughs> in spite of what the religious world will do. <coughs> you remain a sect. I think Yeshua and throughout all the word, the prophets called it a remnant, right? Because a remnant remains the same. It does not go with the culture. It is not creating a bridge and going the same direction. It is always against the culture. And when it's against the culture, you get persecuted. So let me sum this up and <coughs> do an application. Give you three um, PowerPoint slides, and then I'll give you a verse, and we'll be finished tonight. <coughs> so here's a summary and application. Number one, we should not be surprised if we are called upon to suffer for our faith out of the ordinary right now because we're not called little names whatever sticks and stones and baby bones but names <coughs> will never hurt me but there's coming a time when it can increase right in such suffering we may count upon Yehovah through his Ruach HaKadosh to sustain us to give us the grace and strength to persevere in our testimony that will really be the time that you decide whether you're going to trust him or not right now you trust him come to church you'd have no big deal right the only thing you did was, oh, Lord, guide my way, let angels encircle me, because you didn't want some crazy accident, some crazy driver. But you didn't have to sneak in here. You didn't have to run in here. You didn't have to hide in here. You didn't walk here. You didn't go down, park at McDonald's, and then work your way through here. To <coughs> We're not here in the dark. Remember that time we did that as a church? Remember that time? We met here in the dark, then we all ran out and went into the woods. <laughs> we did, Amy. You missed it. It was great. And we slid down and we pretended we were having Bible study down there. Oh, we did some crazy things. Now we just got rid of the things and we're just crazy. <laughs> but, you know, is it a way out for us? Or are you willing to know that he will persevere through it <coughs> and guide you through it, right? <coughs> All right, number three. We have a settled joy in the midst of being persecuted for our faith because such persecution is proof that we have persevering faith. I like that settled joy. Right? You just have a settled joy. <coughs> it's kind of like you know that you know that you know. And it's a okay. Right? <coughs> You're not having joy one moment and depressed the next. Oh, <laughs> glory. You know what I'm saying? A <coughs> little bipolar type of a situation in Christianity. <laughs> you need a little pill or something called <coughs> a merry heart does good like a medicine. We must maintain our strong convictions to live righteously, walking in the footsteps of the Messiah who also suffered for being righteous. Now, you need to understand that. To maintain your strong convictions to live righteously, <coughs> Why do you have to have strong, maintain that strong conviction? Because who in your life is going to sometimes live differently than you are? Your family. This is why mothers are against daughters and daughters and against mothers and fathers against sons and sons-in-laws against that. Because it, it's not always going to, your whole family is not going to follow you. 
Do you still believe in their salvation? Yes. Do you still pray for them? Yes. But guess what? Don't be shocked. Who betrayed Yeshua? An outsider or an insider? <clears throat> now, you don't have to look around. I am just saying <clears throat> that sometimes the worst persecution will come from within. Especially if you're different than the family. Especially if you were like them and then become different. What happened to you? What's going on? Do we need to deprogram you? <laughs> you're walking in the footsteps of <coughs> the Messiah, who has also suffered for being righteous. Right? Was not he different than everyone else? All right, the next one. Last two, we should not look for suffering. Someone say amen for that. As though to suffer means we're more righteous than those who are not suffering. <laughs> Where's my suffering? I am so righteous, I need to suffer. No, no, I'm perfectly uh, giving God praise where I live right now and that I don't live in China, that I don't live in Cor North Korea, that I don't live in an Islamic country that I can't get out of and running for my life and hiding underneath things. I'm thankful that I arrived here worshiping the Lord, can worship the Lord and Spirit and truth, don't have to duck, don't have to run, don't have to hide. We can have our music loud, which I know all of you appreciate. We can worship him and praise him in spirit and truth. We can go home <coughs> knowing that we've done it, that we'll come back and returning again on Sabbath to, to honor the mothers and the women. You'll come with your hats and your gloves and your people and your visitors, and you'll have a good old time. Can you imagine having your hats and gloves and crawling through the mud? I'm not looking for it, people, <coughs> but I'm not going to run from it. But we should prepare our hearts and minds to stand the day of evil. How do you do that? By doing it right now. Listen, we need to be speaking health over us instead of waiting to us to get sick and then trying to get a hold of a healing. Isn't it easier to do preventative medicine? If a <coughs> merry heart doeth good like a medicine then maybe some of you need to look at your heart and start getting married. Right? Because you've been depressed, and then you get sick, and the Bible already told you that the medicine is a merry heart, but it's hard once you, if you, if you are <coughs> sad before you get sick, you're going to be sadder when you get sick. At least if you're happy before you get sick, you have a run and start. Prepare our hearts and minds to stand the day of evil and to remain steadfast in our confession of faith in Yeshua. For when he appears, we will be vindicated in him. Basically, that also means, listen, it's time to get rid of your junk drawer and get some things out because <coughs> you're not going to be able to be able to really do what he wants you to do if you still have all the junk when things happen. Oh, no, we got to run. We're in persecution. Well, I'm not going with them. I'm not with that sister. And wherever you're hiding, you end up fighting with each other, and you get caught because you're fighting with each other because you haven't got that settled yet. <laughs> Let's look at the last verse. I'll let you go home. What time is it? Oh, that's later than I thought. No. <laughs> Glad you too. They were done by 8.30. I don't know what happened. <clears throat> no temptation has taken hold of you except what is common to mankind. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. So <coughs> no temptation can take hold of you except what is common to man, which means we all have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's all common to us, right? So the temptation that's coming to you is common because we all experience the same thing. But, someone say but, but who is faithful? <coughs> he is, which means he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. That means we all push a wheelbarrow around, and whatever that temptation is, he will not allow the enemy to bring you more temptation that you yourself cannot get out of. But with the temptation, <coughs> he will also provide a way of escape so you will be able to endure it, which means not fail in it. So he's there. He's there through your testing, right? Right? To reveal the value of you. And he's even there when the enemy tempts you. 
and gives you a way out if you want it. Sometimes we just don't want it, right? All right, any questions? All right, he's good. Let's stand before the Lord. Hallelujah. <coughs> Don't forget, uh, mothers be here by 9, men be here by 8.30. <coughs> Have everything set up. We're coming men on Friday evening just for a little bit of getting some things ready. So, <coughs> um, Yeah, we will have the Campbells from Tennessee, probably around, um, <coughs> let's just do, because uh, people can eat, let's just do 7.30, we shouldn't be here long. If men you come 7.30 on Friday, we, we should chop some things up and get those hot dogs ready. And <laughs> uh, Praise the Lord. <coughs> they that wait upon the Lord shall remain. They shall run and never faint. They that wait upon the Lord, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and never faint. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord. Hold up.